Hello. Let's talk about this STL titled colorectal carcinoma. This one's pretty difficult. Hope you have snacks. In my mind, it makes sense to talk about the patient first, the clinical presentation of colorectal carcinoma, because that's a commonality between all these different genetic subtypes, histologic classifications. If we started there, we would get caught up in the weeds. How do you diagnose a colorectal carcinoma? Well, it could be symptomatic or asymptomatic. Asymptomatically, these things pop up on colonoscopies. And it's recommended that everyone start getting colonoscopies at the age of 50. And if you have a positive family history, they want you to start getting colonoscopies at the age of 40. So a great many colorectal polyps and carcinomas are caught pretty early on because our screening for this particular pathology is pretty robust right now in the States. These cancers may also present with symptoms of GI pain, hematochesia, which is bright red stool, and bowel obstruction is also a possibility, especially as we start looking at annular tumors in the descending colon. Hematochesia is a common symptom across all of the SDLs on this one particular exam, and so is obstruction too. And there's different workups involved for hematochesia and what you suspect to be something obstructive. Particularly on this one exam, hematochesia, it could be seen with diverticulitis, could be seen with ischemic colitis, it could be seen with inflammatory bowel disease. Any infection of the lower bowel could certainly cause hematochesia. And finally, cancer. So how could cancer cause blood to pour into the lumen of the bowel? Well, for starters, uh, if that cancer is polypoid in nature, meaning if it's protruding into the lumen of the gut, well, then every time that stool passes by, it smacks that polyp and kind of does damage to it, you know. And uh, that polyp only has uh, so much it can take before it starts to bleed because it's vascularized. And uh, that could be one mechanism of hematochesia in the setting of colorectal carcinoma. Also, that polyp can just straight up get ripped off sometimes. Um, that would be a lot of hematochesia. And then third in my mind is the consideration that a cancer, any cancer, is going to uh, exert what's called the Warburg effect and preferentially send uh, glucose as a substrate down to pyruvate and then send that pyruvate after glycolysis uh, over to lactic acid through lactate dehydrogenase. And uh, the production of lactic acid creates an acidic local environment around the tumor. And your other cells don't like that. And your microvasculature responds to lactic acid uh, as best as it can by vasodilating. But acidity will eventually compromise the function, physiologically speaking, of all the live tissue in that area. And uh, local acidity does engender some necrosis and tissue damage and certainly an immune response. So that too is going to uh, induce some damage and then responsive bleeding from not just the tumor itself, but the, the locality it resides in. So that's essentially how you get hematochesia from a cancer. Now, if this occurs in an acute setting, I just want to remind you, your first concerns are going to be airway and breathing and circulation and you're going to uh, check the patient's fluid status, essentially their blood pressure, and you're going to check for tachycardia too, because with GI bleeds, they might go um, unbeknownst for a minute or two, you know. So the patient might have no clue that uh, they're, they're pooling blood into the lumen of their bowel. And so whenever you do discover it, it might have been going on for a long enough time for the patient to have developed a little bit of an anemia um, or even a hypotension uh, segueing into shock due to the amount of blood lost into the gut. So that's our main concern with hematochesia. And for treatment, you're going to get that patient hooked up to some IVs.
You're going to type and cross match them in case they need a transfusion and you're going to start getting some fluids into them. This is a good place to start the bottom of page seven titled pathology. It's talking about the location of colorectal carcinomas. As we said, you might discover them on a colonoscopy. They might be large enough to be seen on imaging sometimes, as in the case with an apple core, uh, annular sort of tumor. Although they are predominantly left-sided. So all colorectal carcinomas originate from adenomas. Uh, that's a benign tumor of benign neoplasm of glandular origin. And then a carcinoma means it's malignant, which means uh, the neoplasm has become invasive um, and is gaining metastatic potential. So that's the direction we're talking about from adenoma to carcinoma. And these colorectal carcinomas kind of all start off the same, you know, just as a small bump. But as they evolve, you know, they have different lineages um, and they can grow into different shapes depending on the genes mutated inside them and on the territory they arise from. So you will see polypoid fungating exophytic masses protruding into the lumen sometimes. And then the other big type of tumor that you'll see in the colon is the annular constricting lesion that has this napkin ring appearance to it. And it will go all the way around the lumen, but it will not pop directly into the lumen like a polypoid. So two patterns, polypoid and annular. Polypoids more common on the right side of the body in your ascending colon over here. And annular tumors are the predominant tumor type in the descending colon on the left side of your body. Now this distinction between left and right is relatively important um, because the symptoms are different on the right side to the left side depending, um, well, I won't say that. I'll say that bleeding tends to be associated with right-sided tumors and obstruction tends to be associated with left-sided tumors because bleeding is the polypoid tumors typically and obstruction is the annular constricting tumors typically. Now I have no clue how the hell they could ask you a question about that because it's just two things to learn, you know, and it's like you never get asked a true or false multiple choice question, but that's here and that's also in first aid. So I figured that they might work that uh, into a question somehow. So what you need to remember is that left-sided tumors tend to obstruct, right-sided colon tumors tend to bleed. Now the sigmoid colon itself is the most common location of colorectal carcinoma. It accounts for about 50% of all of them total, uh, the sigmoid colon into the rectum. And it's also the most common region for diverticulosis and diverticulitis in the large bowel. And that's an, essentially an infection of an inflamed outpouching of tissue. And so, I was really wondering what made the sigmoid colon so susceptible to damage. And I got to thinking about it. And here's the conclusions I've drawn. I figure that your sigmoid colon has to hold on to a lot of poop in between poops. And so while it's holding on to that poop, you know, well, the poop's just sitting there. And as more and more material accumulates within that terminal bowel, the sigmoid colon and the rectum, uh, it just expands and expands and expands the lumen of that section of GI. And so, first of all, poop is pretty dense. Second of all, poop might be in that sigmoid colon for a long time. And so, as it's sitting there, it's exerting a pressure or a sort of mass effect on the walls of the sigmoid colon. And this is causing a minute degree of local ischemia. And it's the same phenomenon as like, you know, if you, if you uh, were to put a tourniquet on your arm, right, to stop bleeding, well, it's like everything downstream would kind of turn blue, right? Or like if you put your blood pressure cuff on too tight and patient's fingers start turning blue, right? 
Think about if you uh, like ever wore like some really tight live live strong bands when you were in like elementary school. You know, it's like you hold down on your you clamp anything long enough and everything distal is going to get ischemic. That's the principle. And so that pressure on the sigmoid valve is probably, I would say, what predisposes it to this high proportion of cancers. So here are what some cancers look like. Take a look at some color images. Here's what we are referring to when we say polypoid and exophytic as well. Um, exophytic means it's protruding into a lumen. Um, and another slang term used is like bunch of grapes. It kind of does look like that indeed. Here's a polypoid colorectal carcinoma. Big one on the right on gross dissection. And then endoscopically on the left, you see a few polyps back to back. So, again, imagine, uh, imagine a stool just passing straight through this. And if it's a particularly big stool, it's going to hurt those polyps because they're sticking right out into that lumen. So that's why these polypoid cancers do tend to present with bleeding. Here's an annular colorectal carcinoma and here's where it's at um that's red's not a good color for that Let's see if blue works these these buggers are pretty hard to spot grossly i will say that um here's where you can see the annular constriction that rings around the colonic mucosa in this area so you can tell that on this left side of the image, we've got a pretty thin gut wall, right? And over here too, it's, it's pretty thin. But then if we're looking at the right side of this image where the cancer is, look at how thick the wall of that GI lumen is. I mean, it is thickened because there is this napkin ring shaped cancer growing around the circumference of that entire strip of lumen. So that's an annular cancer. And can you see how the lumen itself has become narrowed in this setting? That's why you do tend to see obstruction with annular type cancers. So the gross appearance of the cancer is going to be the simplest way that we tell apart different colorectal cancers. Here's another annular lesion in green boxed in. That's the region of the bowel affected. Now in yellow, look at the thickness of the normal bowel. And then look at the thickness of the bowel wall where the annular tumor resides. And you see that the overall lumen of the bowel is much more narrow where the tumor sits compared to a normal zone. That's an annular lesion. Here is an endoscopic view of an annular lesion. You can tell it is not polypoid. I mean, you might mistake it as a polypoid, but you'll never mistake a polypoid as an annular, if you know what I'm saying. And again, you can kind of tell that this mass is growing around the circumference of the whole bowel here. And the lumen has been highlighted with the yellow circle here. And it's just, can you see how that would lead to an obstruction easily, very easily? And so this can bleed too, you know, they're not mutually exclusive. You could have obstruction and bleeding as well. But... Um, this is explaining why obstructions, the typical left-sided symptom, because the left side is more prone to have these annular tumors because the, the descending colon has a bit smaller a diameter naturally than the ascending colon. It's a bit bigger. And so on the left side, you don't have as much room to grow into the lumen 
So you're not as likely to see polypoid tumors on the left side. So we've looked at some colorectal carcinomas grossly now. And we've talked about their symptoms. Bleeding and obstruction are gonna be your two chief symptoms. And anytime you've got a bleed, you're worried about anemia. So it's presented to you in a question stem, maybe not with acute symptoms, maybe if it's in the outpatient setting, you CBC the patient or you take a hematocrit and they've got a low erythrocyte count or they've got a hemoglobin of like eight or nine. And that's gonna be what is nudging you in the direction of a GI bleed. So a uh, recap on page eight of some things we've already stated. Bleeding is most likely in polypoid exophytic and ulcerating tumors. Why? Because they pop into the lumen and they get smacked by stool. Infiltrating and annular tumors cause luminal stenosis and in turn obstructive symptoms. Tumors in the proximal or right colon usually appear as polypoid masses and thus often present with occult bleeding. Tumors involving the distal colon, left colon, or more commonly annular lesions. So your left side tends to have obstructive symptoms. Your right side tends to have hemorrhagic symptoms. That's gross colorectal cancer. Now let's talk about some histological types of adenocarcinoma. More than 90% of colorectal carcinomas are adenocarcinomas originating from epithelial cells of the colorectal mucosa. And looking at the top right here, this is, we're looking at epithelial cells of the colorectal mucosa. And uh, see if I can get some normal colon histology going real quick. Yeah, this is, that's a pretty good look too. Uh, open a new tab. So here we're looking at a normal colon and we can tell that the, the architecture or the structure, the design of the colon, um, it's essentially intended to be one massive absorptive surface And the different glands or crypts popping down into the mucosa are largely there for the absorption of water from what remains, what fluid remains in a stool. So that's a good look at a normal colon. And here it is from a flipped angle, top down, kind of in the top left here. What we see is, uh, and this isn't a normal colon, but this is a well-differentiated adenocarcinoma, so it looks pretty similar to a normal colon. We're seeing glands with normal glandular tissue. And as a adenocarcinoma de-differentiates or it moves farther away from visually looking phenotypically like its cell or tissue of origin, we see that the normal round patent structure of a gland and that round lumen within gets all sorts of bent out of shape and twisted. So on the right, we're comparing a de-differentiated carcinoma to a well-differentiated colonic adenocarcinoma. And I believe most colorectal cancers are gonna look similarly to the top two here. Now we've got some variants to that kind of vanilla adenocarcinoma progression. We've got a mucinous adenocarcinoma, which 
also is arising from the individual columnar epithelial cells of the colonic glands. And what sets this one apart on histology is all of the mucin that you see inside uh, various lumens. There's also a signet ring cell carcinoma. We have seen a signet ring cancer before in what GI organ? We've seen one in the stomach. And if you look at the signet ring cells, uh, they're basically big and round and their nucleus has been pushed up to one side of the cell and they're filled with mucin. That's what gives them that bloated globular appearance like a beach ball and that one is pretty hard to miss so those are two variants of adenocarcinomas then we have what's called a medullary carcinoma and this is another histologic type of colon cancer that remember can present in a polypoid form or maybe an annular form and you're gonna look at the medullary carcinoma and you're going to realize very quickly that it's its own thing. You don't see any glandular tissue here. There's a lot of lymphocytes inside the medullary carcinoma and it's composed of what's called anastomosing sheets of cells and whenever you see sheets, to describe histology what it essentially means is that all these cells in the lower right picture here are in the same plane of section like a sheet of paper you don't see any macro structures going to you or away from you they're all in the same plane there so your medullary carcinoma put that in your memory bank you don't see any glands at all really in it you just see a bunch of uh, bunch of lymphocytes amidst connective tissue. So again, most are going to be these normal dude, typical guy, adenocarcinomas, as you see in the top two photos. And the other four are variants. So a mucinous adenocarcinoma, as we just saw, is 10 to 20% of colon cancers. The characteristic finding is mucin lakes, and it's due to mismatch repair protein mutation, specifically in MSH6. Now we're gonna talk about what these different proteins mean in genes in the context of typing our cancers. And as an introduction, it's very important to number one, memorize these things, but number two, understand different facets of the mismatch repair pathway. What's it trying to accomplish? What do you see? How do you diagnose mismatch instability or microsatellite instability? Those are good things to understand because then you won't be looking at it like, oh my God, what is this? You know? Um, and then likewise in the APC pathway, that's a different pathway getting a little ahead, but there's a different mechanism involved in the APC pathway of colorectal cancer development than there is in the mismatch repair pathway. And there are really two main pathways of colorectal cancer carcinogenesis, and they involve either the APC gene or mismatch repair genes. So, you're gonna get questions about the peculiarities of either pathway. And you're gonna to have to make a diagnosis and then remember which of the two pathways is associated with a particular cancer. So that's our line of thinking. Now back to our different histologies. Again, 10 to 20% of them are, is that mucinous adenocarcinoma. Let me, uh, let me Google that right quick. Uh, just in case uh, it would benefit anybody. And if it doesn't, you can always skip ahead a minute or two. Oh, yeah. So here's what we're looking at. Um, 
So in this picture, you see a whole lot of regions where there just aren't any cells at all. Like, I mean, there's barely any cells in there and there's barely any cells up over in here too, right? And so what are we looking at on the right side of this image? Well, um, we've got this dark, densely basophilic strip of mucosal epithelium. And I'm drawing a dotted line kind of right underneath that epithelial surface. But you can tell that this is epithelium. So it's like the outside of the tissue. It's making contact with the lumen. So that means that all the stuff over here on the other side of it is going to be secretions, mucin that's being secreted out into the lumen. Maybe with a few immune cells thrown in there and other cell types. But what we're seeing that I'll highlight in yellow, just this big swath outside the epithelial cells, um, that's that's the mucinous part of this mucinous adenocarcinoma. It's, it's got a very acellular appearance to it and it'll pick up an eosinophilic stain. That's in the lung. If we can get one more in the colon. Here, yeah, yeah, this is it. This is another good look too. So again, this is a low power look. Check out how little cellularity there is down in this strip here. And these, this is some glandular type tissue. So again, it's an adenocarcinoma and it's very washed out, um, but it's still slightly, slightly pastel pink to it. So you can tell that we're looking at uh, just glands that seem to be over secreting product. And there's also some crud on the top layer of the epithelium there that looks similar to what we just saw in the last photo. So that's a mucinous adenocarcinoma. Signet ring cell adenocarcinoma, another histological type has those vacuoles that push the nucleus to the side of the cell. Medullary carcinoma, characterized by anastomosing sheets of cells with lymphocytes. And then a big, big takeaway at the end of this section, colorectal carcinomas are almost always cytokeratin 20 positive and cytokeratin 7 negative. And that's important because carcinomas that arise from other primary sites are typically cytokeratin 20 negative and cytokeratin 7 positive. So that's going to help us define a metastasis from a primary colonic site versus the is this tumor from that organ or is it a metastasis from the colon. So what have we talked about so far? The gross appearance of different colon cancers and then the histological appearance of different colon cancers. Let's dive into the clinical presentation a little bit more, one more time just for emphasis. Hematochesia or melana could be occult blood, abdominal pain, unexplained anemia, change in bowel habits. Nothing amazing there, nothing baffling. Again, the whole right-sided, left-sided thing, I don't know how they'll ask you that in a question, but it's in first aid, so uh, Apparently, there's a precedence for it. I guess I need to do my U world or something. Tumor markers. What this paragraph is telling you is that we don't determine is the tumor there or not by the level of CEA in the blood. Uh, we use it as a marker after we take a tumor out to see if it's come back, to, to, to take a look and see, have we gotten rid of the whole tumor? Because that's always our concern after a resection is, did we get the whole thing? So if CEA starts creeping back up, you're like, oh boy, got to go back in. Spread and staging. Important to know this. Now, we've got a particular staging 
criterion for colorectal cancer because the layers of the bowel, the bowel's got a little bit more layers to it than most other tissue. And so we define how far is a cancer invaded by how many layers has it gone into. Um, and so just because the bowel layers are different, we've got a little bit different staging criteria. What's continuous between our colorectal cancer criteria and staging for any other cancer is that a metastasis is going to put you de facto at a stage four cancer, okay? So if you've got a metastasis, that's an M1, that's a stage four, and that's the most important prognostic factor when it comes to staging. Other important things in staging are gonna be the size of the tumor. That's really the T part of it. And then the number of regional lymph nodes it's invaded to. And so regional metastasis is considered different from distant metastasis. So when we say the M part, M0 or M1, we're talking about maybe like, oh, it's gone to the liver through the portal vein, through a hematogenous metastasis, right? Or it's gotten into a different organ or it's seeded the peritoneum, not just, oh, it's one lymph node downstream. We would call that an N1. So Big takeaway, stage zero, it's a carcinoma in C2. It's still, it's stuck in mom's basement. Stage four, it's metastatic. Stage three, it's an N1. And uh, between stages one and two, the only real difference is how deep has the tumor penetrated in its locality. So your muscularis mucosa is deep to the muscularis propria, which is going to be like superficial on the outside of the GI tract. And so just imagine that and kind of use those terms to think through it on your own and picture how a tumor would go from a stage one to two to three. Now, regional metastasis is detected in a good handful of patients at the time of diagnosis. If it's hematogenous, it'll go into the portal vein and drain into the liver. Although it could possibly get into the inferior vena cava if the liver is backed up and flow reverses in one of those uh, distal colonic areas of anastomosis. And an example of what I'm referencing is how the inferior rectum drains into the inferior vena cava rather than going into the portal venous system. And then there's a, there is an, uh, portocaval anastomosis at the superior rectum as well. So what does carcinoma in C2 mean? It means that cells look like cancer under the microscope. Individual cells look like cancer. They're very dysplastic. They're very changed and malignant, but they're not as invasive as cancer would be yet. They haven't penetrated the basement membrane, essentially. So colon cancers all like to present very similarly. Now we wanna get into the question worthy components of this SDL that are beyond just simple diagnosis. So let's talk about cancer syndromes. What's it mean when you have a syndrome? Well, it means that half your family has it. You know, it means you have a inherited, it's heritable. You've got a history of the same problem in previous generations of your family. And that means that it's a genetic problem. And because it's inherited and not acquired, the manner in which it's transmitted really matters, which is why different questions about the mechanisms involved in DNA damage between the APC pathway and the MMR pathway are very important. Now, this would be a good time to go to first aid and give it a look. 
First Aid does have a pretty good section on colorectal cancers. We're talking about polyps at the top. And again, a polyp is a precancerous lesion, but some of them are not precancerous. Some polyps, as we'll talk about SDL15, next SDL, are generally non-neoplastic. And there's five of them here. And uh, the sort of things I could see getting asked about these non-neoplastic polyps is for the inflammatory pseudopolyp, it's associated with IBD. Uh, so they could give you a patient with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis and say they have a polyp and then they'd say, what type of polyp do they have? And it's like, here are your five answer choices right here and you have to choose inflammatory polyp. And same thing with a patient uh, with maybe putz jager syndrome and a polyp in the colon, you know, just easy question. What type of polyp is it? And here are your five answer choices. And so you've got to pick hamartomatous polyp. Now, a hyperplastic polyp can evolve into a serrated polyp sometimes, and they are both characterized by this serrated external architecture um, regarding their glandular epithelium. And so I bring that up because it relates to an uh, idea we touched upon briefly earlier in this current SDL, which is the CPG island methylator phenotype. Serrated polyps are particularly associated with that uh, hypermethylation phenotype. And again, uh, when something gets methylated, it gets transcriptionally turned off. And in the case of this serrated polyp, your mismatch repair gene gets turned off. So that leads to a microsatellite instability. And it's also associated with this BRAF gene. I'm just pointing out important things that I see. I'll explain microsatellite instability when we get there in a minute. You really want to understand that all these colorectal cancers, not the benign polyps, but the cancers go back to one of two pathways. That's so big time. You, you start there and you can fill in the gaps in your own knowledge. All these cancers of the colon are going back to either the MMR gene or the APC gene. And so that's stated at the top of page 383 on my first day, 385 in yours, 380 something. You basically got either mutations in APC or mutations in mismatch repair genes. That's it. You got two main ways that a polyp can go to a cancer in the colon. And if you don't have one of these two mutations, you're not going to go from a polyp to a cancer. You're just going to stay a polyp, but it's not going to invade and it's not going to get dysplastic. So that's why this is important. And if we go back to the SDL quickly on page five, that's a good place to go next because the same thing we just looked at in first aid is right here in our SDL. So what does the SDL tell us? Well, it says that colorectal cancer starts off with these precursor lesions called aberrant crypt fo foci. And you can recognize them pretty easily on light microscopy. And when you see them, there's one of two things going on. They've either got an APC mutation or they've got a DNA mismatch repair mutation, right? So it's, it's right there in the text. And if I think there's one important sentence in this whole SDL, it's that, yo. Um, you are going to get cancer of the colon if you have either an APC mutation or a mismatch repair mutation. And if you don't have one of those two things, it's not going to progress to a cancer. It's just going to be a polyp. So the APC pathway is characterized in this box here. Again, it's the exact same box as in first aid at the top of this one page. And you can get asked one of maybe two or three different questions about this APC pathway on an exam. The first is going to be, 
Well, they'll tell, they will tell you that the tumor is in a particular stage, okay, of growth. They'll say, well, you've got this precursor lesion or you've got an adenoma or you've got a carcinoma. And they're going to be like, what's the most recent mutation? Like, what was the mutation that made it a precursor lesion to start with? And so the answer to that would be like APC gene. Or they'd be like, which mutation led to a deregulation of intracellular signaling? And it's the KRAS mutation. And the, the question would be really similar to along those lines. I hate to say it, but it's like, I mean, you got a lot to remember anyways. So it's just straight up memorization. And then for the P53 gene, obviously that would be a knockout of a tumor suppressor gene, allowing for uh, lots and lots and lots of proliferation, but also uh, you stop checking your DNA in between G1 and S when you lose P53, right? So then that's going to make you go from the adenoma to a carcinoma. And that transition, the, the timeline is heavily tested. And colorectal cancer is the cancer they love to test it in because we know a lot about it. So the way to remember the timeline is it's just in alphabetical order. You've got A, P, C, right? And then you've got your K, RAS, and that's K. And then you've got P53. So A, A then K, then P, alphabetical order. And this DCC gene that you see here, uh, D stands for something I can't remember, but the CC stands for colorectal cancer, colorectal carcinoma. So you'll hopefully recognize that too. Now, a deleterious APC mutation can be inherited. And when it is, we call that familial adenomatous polyposis syndrome. So that's actually how our SDL even starts is by talking about all these different syndromes. After we talk about risk factors, it gets straight into the syndromes and it's telling you that the mutations that directly lead to colon cancer get passed down in families and I don't know what I'm saying there. Basically, look out for, uh, in the case of FAP treatment, you got to get your colon removed. Um, and look out for associated lesions here. Fundic gland polyps in the stomach are associated as well. And then it's a knockout in the APC tumor suppressor gene. So the APC pathway of colorectal cancer development uh, can be identified because tumors with APC mutations will show what's called chromosomal instability. And Chromosomal instability can be defined as basically you take a handful of cells from here and there uh, within a tumor and then you just karyotype them and then you compare them to the karyotype of a normal cell in the area and you look and see differences. If there are differences in the karyotype, let's say that maybe the cancer's got like half a copy of chromosome 16, you know, or like a copy and a half of chromosome 11, that would be called chromosomal instability. We're talking about differences in either the quantity, the number, or the quality, like the appearance of chromosomes as we karyotype them between cells. So that's how we will assess APC mutation. We'll say a high degree of chromosomal instability means, yeah, this is a very developed tumor. That's for the APC line. Keep it separate from the mismatch repair pathway of tumorigenesis, which is associated with microsatellite instability. So I guess I'll talk about microsatellite instability now. It's as good a time as any. It's a really tough topic to talk about uh, because I don't know how much you know about it. And 
I posted a comment to this video that's got a very helpful link that helped me understand microsatellite instability. So if you have no clue what it is, click on the video in my comments and it'll give you a good rundown of it. Essentially, microsatellite instability means that you've got a whole lot of repeating regions in your DNA. Maybe it's like a Tata box. That's an example of what would be considered a microsatellite. And whenever your DNA replicates, it has to separate and then anneal itself back together. It's got to paste itself back together. And uh, whenever it pops itself back together, well, your DNA tries to make uh, everything line up exactly as it was before it separated. But in the case of these regions called microsatellites, where you just have like maybe 50 guanines in a row, it's kind of hard to line up those 50 guanines exactly on top of each other. So sometimes you only line up like 47 guanines, right? And so whenever a misalignment happens, when you reattach DNA after it's replicated, you have an enzyme that goes through and checks and says, do we have 50 guanines here? And if you don't, well, that's your mismatch repair enzyme. And what it'll do is it'll unwind your DNA and it will make your DNA recombine itself in an attempt to line up those 50 guanines perfectly on top of each other. Okay. So if you have a defect in this mismatch repair pathway, in our hypothetical example, you would have a 50 guanine section and then you take them apart and let's say you put them back together and only 40 of the guanines are stuck to each other. Uh, if you didn't have mismatch repair genes, you would just keep replicating and replicating and replicating and that part of your DNA that used to have 50 guanines now just has 40 guanines and you're stuck with it. And so we will look for variations in the number of repeats in different microsatellites, such as the 50 guanine repeat, in between different cells. And if their microsatellites show different numbers of copies of repeats of the same areas of gene, we call that microsatellite instability, meaning something has happened to generate duplications or deletions within a microsatellite stretch of DNA from one cell to another. So that is how we diagnose tumors that arise due to defects in the mismatch repair gene pathway. And what's associated with that is Lynch syndrome and serrated adenomatous polyps which can generate some sporadic non-syndromic colorectal cancer. Now if we might as well finish out first aid uh, since we're in here. Look at polyposis syndromes. What does this book have to say? Well, it's telling you that Garner syndrome and Turcotte syndrome are essentially subtypes of familial adenomas polyposis. It's basically FAP plus something else. And so know for Gardner syndrome that you're going to see bone tumors and lipomas and know for Turkett syndrome that you're going to see central nervous system tumors. And the way to remember that Turkett sounds like turban, useful uh, homophone there. Then we've got putz jagger syndrome, which is going to give you polyps of the small bowel and not a lot else gives you polyps in the small intestine. And this is also associated with uh, hyperpigmented macules of the lips and mouth. So that's a pretty unique diagnosis. You shouldn't have a hard time remembering that one. Uh, juvenile polyposis syndrome features hamartomatous polyps, quite like putz jaggers. And again, we see a whole list of five different non-neoplastic polyps up at the top of this page. So that lets me know that I, a question that has been asked on boards is, okay, what type of polyp is this? Um, so there are the associations there. Another question that could get asked is, uh, again, what, what cancer is associated with this polyp or this cancer or this syndrome? And so know the associations whenever they arise. Lynch syndrome, for example, is associated with uh, cancers of the female reproductive system, endometrium and ovaries. And then Lynch syndrome is due to 
hereditary mutations in DNA mismatch repair genes, which are responsible for correcting discrepancies in DNA when it gets pasted back together after it's been pulled apart to replicate. And we call those discrepancies, when we observe lots of discrepancies in different cells, we call that microsatellite instability. So that's about all that first aid has to say about colorectal cancer. Let's get back to the SDL and uh, finish this one out. So definition, talk about that. Epidemiology, check. Risk factors, well, most of them are syndromic. You're not really gonna have to worry about exogenous risk factors. Again, the big questions coming out of this SDL, what's the mechanism for the cancer? What's the gene for the cancer? What other cancer is most likely to develop if they have this one condition? So then how this SDL starts um, is, how we did not start is just by laying out all the syndromes. And again, we've said FAP, it's autosomal dominant APC line. Remember that it's uh, colonic carcinogenesis is going to follow either an APC pathway or a mismatch repair pathway. It's gonna be one of those two things. Then the SDL talks about different types of uh, FAP, essentially. You've got this attenuated type, which has a milder phenotype. Um, However, you're probably still going to have to take the bowel out at some point or the colon. Uh, one more time, fundic gland polyps has been mentioned in association with uh, familial adenosis, adenomatous polyposis, and fundic gland polyps did also tend to have APC mutations in them, as I recall. And uh, APC is involved in the beta-catenin pathway. I think we'll get there in just a little bit. Sorry, brain blast. So then you got Gardner syndrome and Turcotte syndrome, and uh, again, not much to say there, just memorize them. MUTYH associated polyposis. Uh, we're not going to get asked about that. There's nothing they could ask us about. I mean, there's no way to differentiate it unless they tell you, hey, this is a MUTH, MUTYH gene missing. I don't think there's anything you could ask about there. We look at Lynch syndrome. Again, it's due to a defect in mismatch repair genes. MSH2, MLH1. And colorectal cancer is the most common cancer associated with Lynch syndrome, but remember that um, you could see breast cancer, ovarian cancer, highly associated with uh, the inheritance of defects and mismatch repair genes. So here in the text, uh, when we say hypermethylation phenotype, this sentence is really what we're referring to, how um, epigenetic silencing by promoter hypermethylation. Remember that uh, you typically have CG islands around the promoter regions of genes and the promoter region is where you're going to bind your polymerase to to start transcription of that gene. And so whether or not you can bind to a promoter is often determined by the, the methylation or lack thereof of the surrounding CG islands. So when they are methylated, you can't bind to a promoter, you can't express the protein. So when a promoter region for the mismatch repair enzyme is hypermethylated, you can't make it. So you're not repairing mismatches leading to microsatellite instability, which is described um, as being in regions containing short repeating DNA sequences referred to as microsatellite DNA. So that was my example of 50 guanines in a row. That's an example of a short repeating DNA sequence. The Tata box, like CAG Islands and Huntington's, that's technically a microsatellite. And just to hammer that concept home one last time, um, Microsatellites are prone to undergo expansion during DNA replication and represent the most frequent sites of mutation in colon cancer. Uh, I can't believe we got to know all this different stuff, yo. So Lynch syndrome, again, endometrial carcinoma, uh, ovarian carcinoma, breast carcinoma, other common ones. So there are some environmental factors that uh, contribute to sporadic colon cancer. Number one is going to be red meat consumption. Um, and that's due to the iron contained in red meat. And 
So why is red meat red? Well, it's red because uh, it came from slow twitch muscle and it's got a lot of myoglobin in it. And myoglobin's related to heme. It's got the same peripheral ring with an iron in the middle of it. And uh, animals that have red meat tend to just do a lot of standing and they're using that muscle constantly. So it's an endurance type muscle versus white meat. Well, what sort of animal has white meat? Uh, the type of animal that's kind of always uh, eating something or uh, not really, I won't say that. What type of animal has white meat? A chicken or a fish. And like, well, chicken meat's white meat because like chickens aren't using their muscles. You know, look at those things. They're like a foot tall. They're so evolutionary weak, evolutionarily weak. Like we eat them all the time. We just grow them and we farm them. And so it's like, no chicken has ever threatened anyone. Why? He doesn't have any myoglobin. So the white meat's got glycogen up inside it. Um, and glycogen doesn't have any iron in it, so it doesn't have a pigmentation to it. Anaerobic bacteria might be a risk factor for colorectal cancer. Lactobacillus might be protective. Uh, lactobacillus is in a whole lot of yogurts, so eat your Greek yogurt. High fiber diets correlated with a lower risk of colon cancer, and that's because it binds to something called lithocolic acid, which is a bile acid um, produced by bacteria. And a bile acid is essentially a, a sterol of sorts. It's a it's a fatty acid. It's got rings to it, um, and it's it's hydrophobic and lipophilic. And this particular bile acid suppresses tumor apoptosis. So that's really bad news. That means they can just continue to grow unchecked. And fiber will bind that lithocolic acid and just push on out the other end. Aspirins, NSAIDs, uh, have a protective effect, protecting you against the development of colorectal carcinoma. Again, that's just something that they don't want you to know anything about other than that. They just want you to recognize it on a test question. And so we're kind of back where we started off, and this is a good place to end. Um, I've kind of talked a whole lot, so thank you very much for sticking around and listening to all that. Um, key points to end with is going to be that you can trace all these colon cancers back to APC mutations or DNA mismatch repair mutations, right? It's one or the other. Um, so the test question that they present to you is going to be about either you picking out which one is wrong and then inferencing, oh, is this microsatellite instability in the case of mismatch repair, or is this chromosomal instability in the case of the APC mutations? Um, they could also just straight up give you the gene that's out and then say, what does this do? And that's the case with like APC, beta catenin. You know, you'd have to know that it sequesters beta catenin and uh, prevents Wnt pathway signaling. And when you don't have APC, you have a lot of Wnt pathway signaling, which leads to cell growth. They want you to know the timeline that mutations accrue with. Um, and they want you to know what other types of cancer could you get out of it? I guess we didn't talk about this section titled molecular genetics. I kind of winged this one uh, because I didn't like the order that it was presented to us in. This is saying what I just said, APCs in the Wnt pathway, deregulated Wnt signaling leads to cell growth causative factor for colorectal breast and cutaneous cancers. Beta-catenin helps form adherence junctions, which are necessary for the creation and maintenance of epithelial cell layers. With loss of APC function, free beta-catenin accumulates, translocates to the nucleus, and activates the transcription of growth factors such as NYC, and then cyclin D1, which encourage progression through the cell cycle. It's a tumor suppressor gene, so you need to lose both copies. And then activations in the KRAS oncogene occur later on after APC mutations or beta-catenin mutations get the ball rolling. 
Then following KRAS mutations, you've got P53 mutations and chromosomal instability. So all those words there are telling you what uh, the good old diagram up here was saying. And then this last good paragraph uh, talking about MMR defects. The purpose of mismatch repair enzymes is to again make sure that the whole genome gets copied with fidelity. They'll take out a wrong base and put the correct one in. And if they see, recognize an insertion or a deletion, they'll unwind the DNA and correct it. So when we talk about instability, because again, this is a term I had a lot of trouble with, microsatellite instability, basically means you look at a cancer cell and you look at a normal cell. And if the cancer cell's got a different number of microsatellite repeats than the normal cell, you're going to say, oh, this cell must have a mismatch repair defect because it's been mutating in this particular region. That's all I got.